Welcome back. Uh, so today we are going to talk about a topic uh, called counting and combinatorics. Uh, so good news. Uh, the topic today should be a lot less abstract than what we talked about last time, which was uh, set theory. Uh, but for those who kind of completed the reading assignment, whether the topic is applied or pure depends on emphasis. Um, so when we talk about um, combinatorics or counting, um, a lot of us kind of naturally will think about some formula or some concepts that you learn in these classes. As an example, at the beginning of last class, we talked about how many different ways are there to arrange seven Harry Potter books on a bookshelf. And someone correctly basically said that is what is known as uh, seven factorial, seven times six times five times one. Uh, but what we are going to talk about today is something a lot simpler and a lot more basic that sometimes we don't even kind of think about it uh, and I'm going to talk about three principles addition principle multiplication principle and subtraction principle and all three of them uh, I'm going to fo follow a similar recipe if you will I'll first write out the principle in what is probably uh, in mathematical symbols and formula and I'll ask if anyone understands what that mathematical theorem uh, or symbol means. And then after that, I will translate it into uh, English, basically an everyday English word, what that principle is trying to say. Uh, for the more advanced students here, I hope you will try to see if you understand the mathematical representation of it. But for the, let's say, younger or less advanced students in the class, at least you should understand the uh, English version of it. Okay, so the first one uh, is called addition principle. And after the everyday English interpretation of the formula, we will do some examples to illustrate what kinds of uh, counting problems you can apply the principle. Again, I'm going to talk about the mathematical uh, version of this first. Make sure you get the, the sign on the table. Oh, yeah, oh yeah. great. Uh, so this is the mathematical version of it. I'm going to describe it and then I'll ask if anyone can interpret this for us. Uh, it basically said if we have a set, that is the union of m on the set. m is just a number. It could be 10, it could be 100, it doesn't matter. We also say that uh, if you take any two of this uh, set, the intersection is empty. Then the number of elements in this set, S, is equal to the number of elements in the first set plus the second set, etc. So it is called the addition principle. Can someone try to explain to me what this means? So 
So it basically means the following. Uh, let's see the English version of it. Is if you cleverly split the set, you need to count. into some non-overlapping subsets then you can just count them individually Sense to you? So think about uh, the homework that we did last week. Let's say if you have a few sets that are non-overlapping, and if we know, let's say S is equal to the union of A and B, and we know A and B, uh, so this is a term here called disjoint. Basically, they don't overlap. Then when you want to count the S. Then you can just kind of count A and B individually and then add them up. Can I get a show of sign so far? Okay. Uh, so let's do an example to illustrate this. Uh, if something is difficult to count, uh, split them and then count them individually and then after that you can kind of add them up. So to apply these principles, oftentimes the difficult part is how can you split it into individual parts that are number one, not overlapping, that means you won't overcount, but then also individually they are pretty simple to, to count. So let me give an example. Let's say if we want to make a uh, fruit basket um, with at least one foot, that means we are not making a fruit basket that has nothing inside, okay? Um, And we have six oranges and nine apples. How many different ways can we make a basket? Um, so to illustrate what it means is, let's say we have the option of making a fruit basket with one apple and one orange. We can also make one with one apple and two oranges. So then there will be two possibilities. So the question is, if we have six oranges and nine apples in total, how many different ways can we make the fruit basket? Uh, first of all, I want to ask, like, can you show the sign? Does that, do you know, does everyone understand the question? Not the solution, but do you understand the question? Okay. So I'm going to kind of split it, do the clever split uh, for you, and then we'll divide two groups. Uh, one group counts one part, the other group counts another part. So let's say what we want to count is how many different ways. And we are trying to split it into two different types of basket. The first type is there are some baskets that does not have any orange. The second one is with at least one orange. 
So uh, to apply the principle, uh, does everyone agree these two do not overlap? So you cannot have a basket that both does not have an orange or will have at least one orange. Correct? Okay. Uh, so then, if we do that, then the way we count is we just count them separately and then we add them up. So for the first one, uh, how many different ways can we make a basket with no orange? Nine. Nine. Yep. So it's no orange, one apple, no orange, two apple, etc. Okay, so this is nine. What about the second one? If the basket has at least one orange, how many different ways are there to make a basket? Almost, because if you have at least one orange, it is also possible to not have any apple. Oh, uh, so that would be fifty-five. Wait, no, wait, sixty. Sixty. Uh, so again, because it has at least one orange, it could be one orange, two orange, three oranges, four oranges, five oranges, or six oranges. For each of those, you can have no apple, one apple, two apples, three apples together. So 6 times 10, so it's 60. So the answer to this is 69. Can I get a show of sign again? How does everyone feel about, about this? So um, yours is like this? Um, let me try again. Uh, but the question is clear to everyone, correct? Okay. So, uh, if a basket has no oranges, then it has nine possibilities. Does everyone get it? Because you can have uh, zero orange, one apples, zero orange, or uh, zero orange, two apples, zero orange, three apples. So this is orange, this is apple. So that's why in total, there are nine different types of baskets. Are you with me so far? Uh, Daisy, do, do you get this one? Okay. So now when it comes to the basket with at least kind of one orange, uh, I use a similar notation. You could have one orange, no apple, one orange, one apple, So that's why there are 10 here, there are 10 here. Now similarly, you could also have two oranges, no apple, two orange, one apples, and then two to nine. So therefore you have another 10. Now you can also have three oranges, four oranges, five oranges, or six oranges. Under each of those scenarios, you can also have a no apple to nine apples. So that's why it is six set of this. So in the end we have 60. Does it make, does it make more sense now? Okay, cool. So this is the first principle, addition principle. So let's go to the second principle which is called multiplication. I'm going to follow a similar recipe. I'm going to write down something mathematical 
explain it, and then we'll turn it into an English instruction, how it helped us to, to count. Okay? So this is the mathematical description of the multiplication principle. I'll give everyone a few seconds to copy and then to see if you can uh, understand what it is trying to say. And then we'll turn into what it means if we turn it into an English instruction to help us how to count. I'm going to explain it mathematically, and then again, I'm going to turn it into an English instruction that will help us how to count. So what this says is, if we have a set that is a Cartesian product of x and y, so it is a kind of ordered pair, two elements. The first element is from x, the second element is from the set of y, and if we know there are the number of elements, number of items in the set of x is p, the number of elements in y is equal to q, then we can basically count the total elements in the set s as p times q. Uh, I'm now turning it into an English version of it. Okay? If we have to make two choices, If the first choice has P options, P is a number here, like right? 3, 5, 10, okay, have P that, that many options. No matter what options we choose, the second choice still has too many options then the total number of options is P I will verbally make an examples before I take a mathematical one. Think about you go to a, a fast food restaurant. You have two choices of soda, Coke or Sprite. And then you have two choices of your burger, burger or cheeseburger. And then the third choice, let's say just stick with two choices. Then the total number of choices you have is two times two. 
Because the reason is whether you choose Coke or Sprite, you will still have two options for your second choice, which is the burger with cheese or not. So as a result, you have a total of four choices. Uh, so I'm going to do an example, uh, two examples. One is simpler than the other. But after hearing the fast food restaurant example, does this make, make sense to everyone? Can I get a show of sign? Uh, good. So less than do the first example, which has to do with uh, uh, chalk. Let's say chalk has comes in. Uh, three lengths eight colors and four diameters how many different types of So I'm going to recast the calculation or the counting of this uh, in the mathematical way that we just kind of talk about. So think about uh, the length of chalk come into three come in three lengths: one inch, two inch, two inches, and three inches. Okay, and then. Um, color it has eight colors i'm not going to come up with eight colors eight colors here okay blue yellow black etc okay so there are total eight and then for diameter let's say it also comes in four different one a quarter of an inch half three quarters and then one inch um you can really think about this as you're going to a website to buy chalk and they ask you come like what do you choose and they will ask you okay what what length do you want what color do you want and then what is the diameter that you want uh, and we are also assuming that no matter what length that you choose all the eight colors are still available and no matter what length and what color you choose all the four diameters are still available. Now, uh, then using the uh, notation that we have, we basically need to then uh, choose a set of length, color, and diameter, where the length comes from these three. Uh, color comes from this eight, the diameter comes from those four options, so it's like this. And then the total number of different types of charts is going to be the number of choices of those three characteristics independently. So it's going to be three times eight times four. Which would be 96. Hmm? Uh, can I get a show of sign so far? Um, can you Daisy, can you describe which part is uh, you don't you're not so fairly getting it yet? So up until here, you're okay? Okay. Um, so this is the total number of charts is equal to the number of lengths that we have, which is three, 
times the total number of colors, which is eight, and then times four, the different diameters. So that's why S is equal to three times eight times four, and it's 96. Okay. Uh, so let's go to another example. Uh, so this example is still multiplication principle. Uh, but I hope this is an example that I hope everyone will remember it because it's it's going to be useful uh, in some other math classes that possibly you have in school. So if let's say you have a number of n, uh, so this is what we call point prime factorization. So every integer, you could write it as uh, the prime factors, 2, 3, 5, 7. So prime numbers are those that are only divisible by 1 and itself. So every integer can be written in this form. Okay. Uh, so the question is, how many factors Are there. Now, uh, first, let me just ask is the number two a factor of M? Does anyone think yes? So to look at whether 2 is a factor of this, you basically try to divide n by 2 to see if you get a, an integer, right? So if you have this number at the top, The answer is no, because you cannot cancel out the two at the bottom. So far so good? Okay. So let's then just keep trying uh, to see if we can get some insight into what it is. What about... So this means the same. It's 3 to the power 2 times 7 a factor of this number. Any thoughts? Is this a factor of this? Anyone? No? Again, you write the numbers n at the top, and then you write this at the bottom. And if it is an integer, then it is divisible. If not, then it is not. So this one, you can cancel this into 3 to the power 2, and you're left with the 7 at the bottom. So after doing these two examples, I'm going to tell you something that I hope you will believe me. So all the factors of n look like this. Because if you have 7, you have 13, if you have other prime factors that are not one of these three, then you cannot divide n into an integer. Is it believable to everyone? Okay, 
um, how can what what can I be if I is let's say ten is equal to the factor to this? What is the biggest number of i that can be for this to be a factor of of n? Four. Yeah. What is the smallest possible number? Zero. Yep. So I basically would be zero and four. What about J? Olivia, do you know? What's the biggest number that J can be for this to be a factor of N? So then, let's go back to this question. So how many factors are there? And we basically need already know the factor would look like this. Okay. So applying the multiplication principle, uh, if we call this A, we call this B, we call this C, or in other words, you basically choose the number I. From here, and how many choices are there? Five. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. And there are three choices here, so that's three. And then there are eight choices here, a. So the answer to this question then is five times three times eight, which is one twenty. Okay. Uh, so let's go with the last principle. Uh, before we break, uh, this one is called subtraction. So there's a bar at the top. Um, so using the Venn diagram, that little circle, what it basically says is follows. Let's see if you have a set U. And then you have a set that is A. And the question asks you to count a, how many that is. And sometimes it's pretty difficult. Sometimes what you will find is in some of the problems, it is very it is a little bit easier for you to count the opposite, which we give a name is called the complement of A, count the opposite of A, and then count the total. And then in the end, if you do both, both of those, then the A 
is basically the total minus the opposite. Uh, I'm going to write it in English as well, just following the recipe. If A or something is too difficult to count, then count the total and subtract the opposite. So to give a trivial example, uh, which is not practical, but to just illustrate it, uh, if I tell you, uh, let's say in, a, in your class, there are 20 students, 12 students wear glasses, how many students do not, have, do not wear glasses? So 20 minus 12. So that's eight, okay? So counting the opposite, okay? So let me give you an example. Uh, the example is going to be, now let's look at this principle again. If it is difficult, count the opposite, okay? Uh, and I'm going to give the example that will look pretty complicated. And I'll give everyone a second to see how we can apply these principles. Uh, computer, let's say if you are asked to choose a uh, computer password that has six symbols. Okay, what I literally mean, there are six keystrokes that you need to choose. Okay? Uh, and the choice of your password for this question is 0 to 9 or small letter A, B, to Z. Uh, so in other words, there are 36 possibilities. Okay. And the question is, how many passwords would have a repeat symbols. Let's get everyone a few a few seconds. Two consecutive numbers, two consecutive digits or two in the same same password. Uh, meaning all these six have to be different. Uh, for example, one, two, one, three, four, five is not allowed. Meaning that even if the two symbols do not appear consecutive, it is still not allowed. It has to be six. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, so that would be the opposite. I think I just gave away the answer. Uh, so I uh, have a repeat symbol, meaning one, two, one, three, four, five, is counted as a repeat as having a repeat symbol. So let's say if we don't talk about have have a repeat symbol, if I just ask you six simple passwords, how many possible passwords are there? Uh, let's say if I cover this part. Six simple computer password, each symbol have 36 choices. How many possible passwords are there? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. 36 to the power of 6? Yeah. So, 
uh, all six symbol passwords, then this is 36 to the power of 6 because you can pick the 36 symbols as your first symbol similarly for the second one and the third now uh, this is a, an example for the subtraction principle uh, it's because counting this is actually difficult but what is the opposite of having a repeat symbol? If a password does not have any repeat symbol, then we say that the six symbols are unique. unique. Is everyone with us so far? So six symbols, either all the six symbols are unique or you have a repeat symbol. So if the question asks you number of passwords with a repeat symbol, and that is hard. But having six, counting how many passwords the six are unique is actually easier. Uh, so imagine if you are sitting in front of your keyboard, you need to type the six symbols out of these 36 uh, possibilities. Let's say you put the first one uh, as zero. You can have 36 choices on your first keystroke. How many choices do you have in your second keystroke? So let's say you pick one of the 36 as your first symbol. How many remaining choices do you have in the second one? And after that, what about the third stroke? Mm -hmm. um, I have the numbers in front of me, but I'm not going to do the subtraction, okay? But basically, this is uh, roughly 2 billion. This one is roughly 1.4 billion. So after you subtract this two, the answer to this question is about 700, 770 million, many passwords. Yeah, the number is that big.